Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming to this workshop that will try to cover all aspects of writing and editing and agenting and publishing and publicity. I don't know how much we'll get through with it. Um, I thought I'd begin by telling you a little story of how um, last February I was invited to speak at the University of Michigan, which is my old alma mater. So I uh, was invited to speak about my book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. And um, I had some time during the day, and I went to the quadrangle, where it's the center of campus, and just sort of sat there and just reminisced about, oh, yeah, I remember, I remember the girl I dated in that, oh, I remember my <laughs> psychology class, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, I remember the chemistry professor. And while I was sitting there, I'm watching these kids scurrying to class, and there was this young man on his way to class, and he looked like he was about 17 or 18 years old, and he looked a lot like the way I looked when I was 17 or 18 years old. He had a book bag over his head, very, very earnest young man. And I had this fantasy, and the fantasy was that this was me. And I was on my way to class, and the year was 1954. And suddenly, I look ahead of me, and this old man gets up from this bench and walks over to me and puts his arm around me, and he says, son, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. You're going to be a surgeon in San Francisco, and you're going to be back on this campus 40 years from now because you will have written a book about the goddess. And I, I, I would have looked, I wonder, what, what was this guy smoking? I mean, you know, this is, that was so out of the realm of my horizon at that time in my life that I couldn't believe, you know, I would never have believed that it all played out the way it, it did. And um, I never aspired to be a writer. I mean, I... You know, I took freshman English uh, as part of the accelerated pre-med course that I had, where you take four years of science and three years to get into medical school early. And then I went to medical school and then internship and a couple years in the Army and then, you know, surgical residency. I God, I felt like I'd been in Marine boot camp, you know. It's a very intense, very, there's not a whole lot of time for um, anything else because it's all about skill acquisition. So um, the most extensive writing I did was uh, I used to write progress notes and patients' charts. <laughs> so, um, so what happened, and this is sort of the way I got into writing, is uh, at the age of 37, um, I was just started in private practice, and I was in that uh, you know the takeoff stage of being a young surgeon and, and getting busy, and I had three little kids and. And I got diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which, what, you know, the great dartboard of life. I mean, suddenly this thing came out and struck me down, and the next thing I know, I was undergoing five operations and six months of radiation treatments and, you know, lost about 40, 45 pounds on my hair. I looked like I was going to die from the treatments, not from the illness. So. It was devastating, and um, to say the least. But when the doctor first gave me this diagnosis, and I asked him, I said, well, what are my chances? He used a line that I thought that they only used in movies. He said, well, if I were you, I'd get your affairs in order. And I said, what? I, I mean, what are you saying? He said, well, you have about a 50-50 chance of surviving five years. So then he left the room, very brusque guy. and. My best friend walked in and found me hysterical. I mean, I was weeping and how could this, it's like a hand grenade in my head. And he said, Lenny, he said, something good is going to come out of this. And I looked at him and I said, you fucking crazy? <laughs> what, what good could come out of being told you've got cancer? He says, I don't know, but something good's going to come out of this. And of course, he was just trying to make me feel good as a good friend. But that was the year 1974, and for those of you who are old enough to remember, 74 was the year of Watergate and the Vietnam War, and Kubler-Ross wrote this book about death and dying. So the, the entire country was in a state of grieving, and suddenly there were all these workshops about death and dying, as if people don't know how to die, as if people don't know how to die. But if you remember, there was all, suddenly there was this great interest in how to die, Book, books and books and books about how to die. So somebody had a conference in Berkeley, and they thought it'd be a really good idea if um, 
if I gave a talk about that, because I had been a fellow of the American Cancer Society and I had operated on a whole bunch of people who were dying, and now I went through this experience myself. And they thought, well, this is a real interesting perspective. So I never did anything like that before, but I went out and gave a talk about my own personal experience. So when it was over, uh, this man came up to me and he said, you know, what you had to say today was just terrific. Do you have that written down? And I said, mm -hmm. I made some notes. And he said, well, I'm editing a book, and I've got Carl Menninger and Hans Selye and Linus Pauling and Norman Cousins, <laughs> and they're all writing the chapters in this book, and the title of the book is Stress and Survival, The Emotional Realities of a Serious Illness. And I want you to write down exactly what you said today. Don't change a word, and I'm going to make that a chapter in the book. So I almost turned it down because I said, well, I've never done anything like that before. So I said, well, OK. So I, I sat down, and I, I wrote this chapter. And then the book came out, and it was a, you know, sort of a medical book. It was published by Mosby. And it won some kind of a nursing prize for the year. And then a very strange thing started happening. I started receiving phone calls and letters from people from all over the country who had said that they had read this chapter and were very moved by it. And they, you know, their mother has this, or their son has that, and they want to ask me, of course. So I said, wow, something, something I wrote had an effect on people. So um, there was talk of my expanding this into a, um, a, a full-length book. And I said, I don't want to do that, uh, because if I do, then I'm going to be a victim. You know, I mean, I, I was, it was hard enough as it was to write it, to relive the whole thing. And although for some people it's very cathartic to write about these terrible experiences of your life, there's a trap, and the trap is that if you start writing about it and reliving it, then you're going to be reliving it all the time. And you're constantly revisiting it, and there's a point in your life where you've got to move on. So you have to, you have to weigh whether how much do you want to cathart and tell the world about your troubles, how I overcame my drug addiction, how I overcame my heart attack, you know. Because you, know, you read these books, there's, they're out there all the time. So. Um, so what ended up happening is I decided not to write that book, but I then became interested in writing, and I started writing, and I wrote uh, Art and Physics first. And I'll get back to this story later, because I want to make sure we get enough time for questions and answers. But the end of the story is, is that last year I received this literary award at this very fancy dinner, and, and I told this story, and I had my friends sitting in the front row there, and I said, Fred, you were right. Something good did come out of this. I mean. I mean, it's so, it's so bizarre that I don't, I don't think that had I gone through this terrible experience that it would have ever occurred to me to be a writer. You know? So, you know, life is very, very strange. <laughs> let, me, let me talk about a few uh, things. How many people in this room consider themselves a professional? Okay. Well, you got, a, you got one strike against you as a writer, okay? <laughs> you know, a professional, the difference between a professional and an amateur is a professional is somebody who does a professional job whether they feel like it or not. That, that's the definition of a pro. The show must go on, okay? The other thing about being a professional is that you're not going to let yourself get involved in emotional stuff with whatever you're dealing with. You're a pro. So whether you're a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a scientist or a lawyer or a social worker, you are trained to be objective because that's what your role in life is. So to be objective means that you then put everything outside and you step back and you're, and it's, you're objective. And you know, when I'm a surgeon, I finish an operation and I have to dictate an operative note. So I go into the dictating booth and I dictate an operative note and I say, the patient was taken to the operating room, the abdomen was open, the spleen was removed, the, the patient was closed, the patient was returned to the recovery room in good condition. I never say, I took the patient to the operating room, I opened the abdomen, I took the spleen out, because you're not supposed to do that. So, so you are trained, as I was, to put everything in the passive voice. Now, the passive voice is fine if you're writing a clinical report or if you're writing a scientific article but writing in the passive voice is sort of like a limp dick. I mean, it's sort of like it has absolutely no, nothing in it that is, is powerful. And what ends up happening is that professionals try to become writers, and the hardest thing they have to overcome is this business of trying to be this 
clinically detached about what you're writing. You cannot do that. You know, I, I put, I, when I edit what I write, I, I uh, put on my passive voice antenna. I go, do, 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 do. And I start reading it through for passive voice. That's a passive voice, passive voice. And try to change all the verbs from it has been to I did or, or make it active voice. And the difference between uh, putting a verb in the passive tense and the active tense is very important. Makes the big difference in writing. Now, it may sound like it's a very simple matter to change active to passive, from passive to active, but it's not. Now, it's okay to have passive voice in a secondary clause, but it should never be starting off a sentence. It shouldn't be the main verb in a sentence, okay? Now, the other problem, the second strike that you all have is that you're professionals and you've learned a professional language. And all the professional languages have reached back into Latin for their jargon. So you are enamored with words that end in T-I-O-N, A-T-E, and N-E-S-S. -S. All those Latinate multi-syllable words, they sound good when you're a lawyer or a doctor and you're writing them out. They're terrible when you're a writer. The English language has these little gritty, little small words, you know, top, home, sharp, talk. And these words are much better to use than big words. I mean, big multi-syllable words. So, you know, if you're gonna say communicate, say talk. If you're gonna say uppermost, say top, you know? I mean, it's, it, it, there's a wonderful, if you wanna have a nice little exercise, take, go to your bookshelf and take down Farewell to Arms by Hummingway. And just look at the first paragraph of the book. I, I don't think he uses a multi-syllable word in the whole first paragraph. It's all these one little, little words. You know, Hemingway said that writing should be like architecture. It, it shouldn't be like interior design. You shouldn't have a whole lot of stuff in it. And the other thing is that a lot of people, when they're describing something, are in love with adverbs and adjectives. I know I am. And you, know, and, and you find this one adjective or adverb to use, and it's so good, you've got another one, you just can't resist putting it in there. And pretty soon, your sentences start getting all filigreed and, and all arabesques, and it's, it's too much. So you have to be able to write sparely. You know, people, just think about the people that you know that when you talk to them, they talk too much. It's a pain in the neck to listen to them because they can't get to the point. So, so you keep that in mind when you're writing because you want to get to the point. Your reader, you know, nowadays, the attention span, um, everything is speeded up. Nobody has the luxury to just sit and read letters and, and, you know, because there's too many things to do. I mean, you can go roller skating or play a video game or watch MTV. Everything is, you know. So as a result, when you write, of course, there's something charming about the very leisurely writing, but you have to get to the point because you don't want to make these sentences too long. That's the other thing. If a sentence gets to beyond three lines, break it up. You know, no, no, no four sentence, no four line sentences. They're they're just too. It it it. You, the brain has to follow and then f put the subjunctive. Um, um, phrases in and it gets kind of complicated. So it's very important that, you know, if you see that a sentence is too long, break it into two sentences. Um, now, the other thing is you have to be, um, um, I have a personal thing about people that are taking verbs and making them into nouns, like strategize and concretize. I mean, my, it's like someone taking fingernails across a blackboard when I hear that. I mean, it's you know, a verb is a verb and a noun is a noun. Don't, don't start mixing them, you know, because it makes for not good writing. The other thing is, is to be very careful about cliches. Um, a cliche, you know, uh, Marshall McLuhan said that nobody in a um, oral society ever uses cliches. There's no such thing as a cliche in an oral society. Cliches only become cliches when you write. And then a, a phrase becomes overused. And as soon as I see somebody using cliches, 
then I know that this is not a very good writer and that I'm not going to read anymore because it's a pain in the neck to read. Because if you can't think of a fresh way to say something and you're going to rely on this, you know, the wake up call or the bottom line, I mean, you know, these are cliches and everybody's using them and you don't want to use cliches. Even though they're very familiar and they may seem very apt, forget it. The other thing is to be very careful about jargon. You have a way to talk and write that is known to you. I remember when I was a, uh, I used to write the plays in medical school. You know, the first, uh, you know, the, the seniors, uh, the, every year that each class puts on a, a play that makes fun of the professors. And I remember the first time I did this, we sat around and we were falling on the floor laughing so hard at all these in jokes. And then we put the play on and nobody laughed because only the, only the people in the play understood the jokes. So it's the same thing with jargon. If you're going to use phrases or expressions that are known to only the people within your group, then you're going to um, lose your reader. Now that said, there are some wonderful words, like for example in medicine there are some terrific words that I love to use that are jargon, they're medical terms. And I have to, you know, when you, what you're doing when you're writing is you're, you're saying basically, you put a hook into the reader and you say, come along with me for the next 400 pages. It may take 18 hours, think of that. You know, I mean, it's a long time. If at any time you become boring, they fall off the hook, that's it, to close the book, you're gone. So you can't be boring. And, and when someone's reading along and they come to a word they don't know or a phrase they don't know, it stops them. And then they say, and you've all had the experience, what does that mean, you know? Now, you have to balance this on that one hand because I sort of look like at words as, as some words are becoming nearly extinct and they're great words. So like for instance, in the alphabet versus the goddess, I apologized in the first, in the preface, I said, listen, I feel that it, as an environmentalist, it's my job to try to preserve some words that are just about ready to disappear from the English language. So I'm going to challenge you as a reader uh, to, and I'm going to use some words. So I warned them in advance, and many people said, gee, I had to read, have a dictionary, you know, next to me when I read your book. You know, well, good, you know, that you looked up these words and, and got to know what they are. You can't use too many of them, because then it looks like you're very pretentious and you're trying to impress the reader with what you know, and, and people get put off by that. So it's a it's a very difficult balance, the balance between using le mot juste. What was the story about Flaubert? That Flaubert used to roll around on the floor looking for le mot juste, you know, the right word to use in the sentence. Um, so that said, um, there's also the business about foreign phrases and, um, and technical terms. And technical terms are different than jargon, you know. I mean, there's, jargon is jargon and technical terms are specific to the, your own field. So I had a tough time in the new book because I wanted to use a number of foreign terms and technical terms. How many peer, people here know uh, what the phrase a deus ex machina means? Okay. Deus ex machina is a Latin term which means a god and a machine. Uh, you know, and what it means is that when the playwrights in ancient Greece used to write plays and they came to a place in their plot that they couldn't figure out how to get from one pl plot point to the next, you know, they, and then a miracle happened, you know, and they would have this god arrive on the stage on a series of wires, you know, this guy with the actor would come down and then would, he, would, he would make it happen and then he'd disappear and it's called a deus ex machina. You've probably seen the phrase and didn't know what it meant or where it came from. Well, I love that phrase. So I used it in the very preface of the book, and my editor at Viking said, well, you know, you sure you want to use that because people aren't going to, a lot of people aren't going to know what it means. And I said, yeah, because I've seen it myself and I didn't know what it means. I had to go look it up and find out what it means, but it's a great phrase. So I compromised, and what I did is I put a little, I put a little uh, asterisk or cross and at the bottom of the page, if somebody is so inclined, they can read what a deus ex machina means and then go on. Of course, having the reader drop out of the body of the work and down into the footnote is 
Um, some people love that, some people don't like that. I mean, I happen to like it. I think the footnotes of books contain lots of juicy little pieces of information. Other readers don't like it. I've seen books, I read a book by Oliver Sacks, uh, The uh, Sounds of Silence, where each page was, one third was the page, and then the other two thirds was footnotes, you know, which after a while got, come on, get on to the story here already. I mean, I don't want to read such a long footnote. And then there's always the question, is you put the footnote in the text or you put the text in the footnote, you know, and then that's a, a balancing act that you have to kind of figure out what you want and the way you want the reader's voice to go through, the way they were, the reader will follow your voice, which gets into the subject of an author, authorial voice. When you write a book, you have to have a voice. First, the first question you have to say, who, who's my audience? Who am I writing this for? And once you decide, is your audience a very specialized audience? Is your audience um, the kind of people that, write, that read self-help books? Is your audience uh, college students? I mean, who's your audience? So that's the very first question you ask. And then once you've answered that question, you say, what kind of voice do I want to maintain? Like when I first wrote this book, I felt that because I didn't have any credibility, and you know, I'm a surgeon from California writing a book about art and physics, that no one's going to take me seriously, so therefore I have to kind of be somewhat professorial. So I, I tended to write, a, write, write the book in a little more stiffer tone than I speak. And then uh, when I wrote the second book, that kind of, I wrote it a little more colloquially. But still, I still wanted academics to take it seriously, so I had to maintain a certain, write it like a historian. When I wrote this book, um, Viking said, we want you to be edgy. I said, edgy? What does that mean? He said, well, that's the new term in New York, you know, edgy. So, so I kind of loosened up and wrote in a different tone. Now, when you listen to a symphony, a symphony has different movements. And, you know, it has an allegro and it has a scherzo. It has different kinds of, of music. And you don't want to maintain the same voice all the way through, at least I don't like that. I like to see the, the author kind of change voices a little bit, not a whole lot, because if you do it a lot, then it's very, very unnerving. You can't switch from, from being uh, talking some, about some uh, academic and then suddenly start talking about colloquial, throwing in a lot of colloquialisms. Now, which gets to the point about um, uh, what I was going to say, let's see, I, just, I just had a point I wanted to make. Um, well, it'll come back to me later. Um, so, so many people have asked me, well, how do, you, how do you do your research? And someone asked Joseph Campbell whether or not um, he meditated. And Campbell said, no, I underline. <laughs> so, so what I do is, I, I, read, I don't read a book without a pen in my hand, and I underline, or I'll make marks in the margin, and I'll put a number of exclamation points depending upon, I have a, a series of four exclamation whether I consider this is a really good point, secondary point, third point. And then when I'm reading along and I find a word, it may be a common word, but for some peculiar reason, it's not in my vocabulary. I don't use it. But it's a good word, so I'll put a, a W there, meaning that this is a word I need to remember. And then if, a, if an author has used an absolutely gorgeous word phrase, put a couple of words together, I'll put WP, word phrase. And then after I finish reading the book and I get prepared to write the next book, I hire some kid, then I go back to the book, and I have a series of post-its with me, and I mark the pages that I want copied. And then I, I put post-its in the pages that I want copied, and then I have him go down to Kinko's and run off all the pages that I marked. Then I get this huge stack of pages, and those that have W's or WP's are separated out. And then I make a list of all those words, the words I want to learn, words that are perfectly good words that I don't ever use, and I want to start using them, and I want to remember to use them. And uh, word phrases, I mean, I don't want to plagiarize from somebody else, but sometimes there's some incredibly elegant ways other people have written it, and I want to read to see how did they do that? I mean, how did they put that together? 
Now, I consider that writing is a lot of its poetry. And the poetry consists of you creating a mental picture, a metaphor in the reader's mind that explains the concept you're trying to explain or make the point that you're trying to make. And to do that, you have to get poetic, which means you're going you're to choose another way of saying something to stand for something else. The danger, of course, is that you get too poetic, in which case it becomes so obscure that nobody knows what the hell you're talking about, or that you get carried away, and before you know it, you have written this incredibly rich metaphor that is so metaphoric that um, it's too much. And then the big danger for young, uh, not necessarily young, but new writers, is the danger of the mixed metaphor, that you start a paragraph with one kind of a metaphor, and then in the middle of the paragraph, you switch to another metaphor. And now you've got a couple of metaphors in there, and, the, and, the, and they don't match. So you either have to, you know, you have to be consistent and not, um, not have your metaphors be um, um, too complex or mixed. Now, um, when it comes to, oh, and then when, once I have this stack of research papers, that I, all, all these things that I have, then I have an outline in my mind, and by the way, there are some people that organize what they say in advance. I never quite know what I'm going to say. I have a vague idea, not quite sure where I'm going. I trust the muse. I'm, I'm utterly shocked when the book is over and I take it in my hand. I did, did I write this? I mean, because I go through a stage where it's so disorganized that I can't imagine how I'm going to organize all this material. But the way I get started is I make a series of folders of the, of the main points I want to make. I don't call them chapters. These are just the main points. And then I start taking this stack, and I start sorting them out and putting in what folder I think this point goes and in what folder that point goes. And pretty soon, I've got it separated out into a lot of different folders. And then when I'm prepared to write that particular area, I go back and I read what, I, what was it that I thought was so spectacular in this other book that speaks to what I'm going to be writing about or what I want to say, and it helps me organize what I'm going to say. So, so as a result, um, that, that's the way I get started. Now, everybody has their own style of writing. I mean, some people, um, you know, who, who is it, Eugene O'Neill used to have somebody chain him to a desk. So he couldn't get up, you know. I mean, there's a whole ritual of of people that would, you know. They, they, there's a whole thing of the things that you can do. Uh, I, I know all my my delaying bits. You sharpen the pencils and go make another cup of coffee. And oh my gosh, you bring in the mail. I mean, there are all these things that you can do to stop yourself from sitting down and actually starting to write. Because writing is hard work. Okay, it does. And then when you first write, you should just kind of just just let it flow, and then just write it down, and then. Usually with the first draft, you say, God damn, this is good. Oh, God. And then what happens is then you read what you wrote, and, and it's not so great. And then it starts to get very disorganized. And it's somewhere between draft three and draft seven that you're totally discouraged. You say, this is just a mess. This is never going to make any sense. I'm not going to get it organized. And then you just keep, this is where you have to be persistent. I, you know, when I was a kid, I remember I was about 10 or 11 years old, and I, or maybe a little bit younger, and I went to some friend's house. They had a lake, and the, and the parents had a ski boat, and I'd never water skied before. And they had these lineup of all these kids, and they were taking water skiing. And I was sort of at the end of the line, and each kid tried to get up on the water ski, and they kept falling off and falling off. Then I was watching all this, and I thought, I'm thinking, is this something I really want to do? I mean, it doesn't look like a whole lot of fun. So finally, it was my turn, and I got the rope, and they told me what to do, and put your you know, knees in. One, two, three, started the boat, and by God, I got up on the water skis right on the first shot, you know? And I was so shocked that I was up, and I must have gone maybe 50 yards before I fell off. And then I didn't let go of the rope, and the boat kept going, and I'm <laughs> So finally, when the boat came up, I swallowed all this water and was drowned, and they said, you know, you're supposed to let go of the rope. And I thought to myself, well, this is a wonderful metaphor for my life. I mean, you know, this is, I, I, I'm an extraordinarily tenacious person, but you know, th that's a good virtue, but on the other hand, it's a vice because you've got to know when the time to let go, you know? <laughs> so, so as a result, um, 
editing is you gotta hang on to the rope, even when you're swallowing a lot of water. I mean, it's, it's John Kenneth Galbraith said, it's only after the ninth rewrite that found, things begin to sound spontaneous, you know? And, and I think to myself, nine, what is he talking about? I do like 30 or 40, you know? I mean, it, it, you just have to keep reading it and reading it and making it better. And I think of Michelangelo when, when he was doing the David, you know, when it got near the end, he spent hours and hours of polishing and polishing, getting the veins to stand out just right. And, and that's the stage. So there's these three entirely different stages of writing. That first stage of just blech, getting it out. And then the next stage, which is just such hard work and so discouraging. And then the third stage, which is the polishing. And the polishing is, you know, I'll go to bed at night thinking of sentences and then wake up and say, I got a better word to use in that sentence. And then change that word, you know, just to make that sentence read better. Um, so the editing process is very, very important. I mean, people that don't spend a lot of time editing are not good. I mean, you know, Voltaire apparently wrote and never edited. He wrote in the ink pen, never changed a word. I mean, it boggles the mind when I think of that. Apparently, uh, um, uh, Jefferson did that too. He didn't change very little. But I have to change a lot. Thank God for word processors. I mean, you know, I just, um, just keep reading it over and over and over again. And, um, and that's where there comes a point where you need somebody else to read it. Now, if you're going to write something and you want other people to read it, you have to, the, the tendency is that you want to say, read this, read this, please, look at me, look at me, please read this, read this. <laughs> if you do that, then you're going to burn all your bridges. So you have to think in your mind, who do I want to read this first draft? Who do I want to read the second draft? Who do I want to read the final draft? You have to save your, keep your powder dry. If you go to a pro that you want to get, um, say, a blurb from or, or, or some real professional opinion and you show them a first draft, you're going to lose them. You know, I remember I went to the art critic of the Chronicle. You know, I, I showed him a very early draft of this book. He hated it. You know, very discouraging. Now, so you want to pace yourself when it comes to editing. And if you're serious about this, you're going to have to pay an editor. And you, you want to do the editor before you get to a publishing house. Because they used to have a lot of editors at publishing houses. But with all this conglomeration that's been going on, they don't have a lot of editors anymore. And the, the Maxwell Perkins that held Thomas Wolfe's hand and, and, and brought it along a whole generation of great writers, the, those Maxwell Perkins types of editors are very, very rare in the publishing world. So you have to bring a finished pro a relatively finished product. They're, they're going to edit it, but you want to have somebody else do it beforehand. And I've, um, I've, um, I hire editors. Now, I discovered something with this last book, which was just a marvelous thing to do, and that is um, I needed someone to help me with the Biblia, uh, with the, um, uh, uh, organized the footnotes in the bibliography. So I asked for an anthropology student. I had my, my son-in-law as a professor of, over at Berkeley. So I said, put a notice up on the anthropology board over there and see if I can get a grad student for 15 bucks an hour and see if he'll um, help me organize. And I had the note up there for a month. I didn't get a single uh, taker. You know, I thought to myself, wow, these kids are, you know. <laughs> I was surprised at that. So my son said, well, why don't you go to Craigslist? I said, what's that? And he said, well, it's this little, and they have them in just about every city now. And uh, you can sell things on it. You can, you know, there's kind of personal ad, uh, not, uh, uh, want help, ad, uh, help wanted ads. So he made up a little ad and he said, you know, author of, uh, looking for a research assistant to help with this book. And the next day I came and I opened my email and my God, I, it took me days to clean my email box out. There's so many talented people that are out of work right now that they leap at the chance to do something for which they're trained. So I, was, I, you know, I hired this one person right off the bat, uh, and then I had all these wonderful names and these people sent me their resumes. So I, I got this great idea. I was reading this one, you know, this was, I got graduated with a degree in primatology and archaeology and anthropology. So I said, I know what I'll do. So I, I selected 10 people and I said, look, the book's almost finished, but I'll pay you $200 
I don't expect you to edit this. I just want you to be a reader. Read it through for accuracy. Read it through. Tell me what you find that really offends you. Tell me what you think is way off base. And all these people leaped at the opportunity, you know. And I told them, I said, you know, if you do, you know, I'll put you in the acknowledgments. So, so for two thousand dollars, I got ten people, and of course, they all thought they were auditioning to be an editor. So many of them did a, an incredibly <laughs> thorough job, um, and and they added significantly to the accuracy of the book by culling out a lot of different things that I wouldn't have picked up, maybe I didn't know about. Because I tend to write books about wide subjects and I, I'm just not an expert in everything. And I sort of feel like I need to find a whole bunch of other minds, take my material and shove it through the sieve of their mind so that they will pull out those things. I remember when I wrote uh, Alphabet, I had the word squaw in it. They said, you can't use squaw. I said, why not? I said, well, it's politically incorrect. I didn't know that. I mean, I thought squaw was a perfectly acceptable word. And, uh, I just was uh, apparently asleep at the switch when they announced that you no longer can use the word squaw. <laughs> so it's those kind of things, you know, that this, and uh, you know, I don't know, if, but it worked very well. And I think that there's a lot of people that are very qualified that were very interested in helping you um, edit and, um, and write. Now, there are writing workshops that you can go to or you can join in your area. Um, they have them in just about every city. I just was faculty on the Squaw Valley Writers Conference workshop. I myself have never been to a workshop. And I was, um, I was there with my hero. My hero was Richard Seltzer. I don't know how many of you have ever read any of his books, uh, Mortal Lessons or Confessions of a Knife. He's a fabulous writer. So he was conducting the workshop, and because I write mainly nonfiction, I was sort of his helper, you know, so to speak. And every day, uh, everybody who came to that workshop had to get accepted, and they had to submit a sample of their work, and then they had to submit a work in progress. And then each night, we were assigned two people's works to read uh, of that workshop. And then we came the next day, and everybody in the group discussed the work. and. I have, I have mixed feelings about it because, number one, I came away with the feeling like, wow, um, it's a good thing I never went to a workshop because maybe I would never have tried this um, if I would have been, had my work torn apart by so many different people. Number two, um, I learned a lot. I mean, I was sat there and I said, oh, I didn't know that, you know, and whoa, I didn't know that either, you know, whoa. <laughs> so, um, so the problem is, is that if you ask somebody, would you please edit, they may be your best friend or lover or whatnot, and what happens when you ask someone to edit your work, they get this demonic, <laughs> you know, they like change, it, you know, the hair starts growing on their palms, the canines get long, they get this blue pencil. I mean, I have a very good friend of mine, and, and, and when he edits my manuscripts, when I read his notes in the margin, they're vicious. <laughs> so, so then what happens is then, there's a part where you have to trust your own judgment. You have to trust your own voice. I'll tell you a story. Um, when my first book was um, purchased by Morrow, um, you know, um, she said to me, uh, this young uh, woman editor, and I said, uh, I met with her in New York, and, and she said, great, you know, she says, I'm really excited about this book. I want the finished manuscript back on my desk January 1st of the following year. I said, you got it, it'll be there. And then I noticed that she was slightly pregnant. And I said, expecting? She said, yes, I'm expecting in January. And I thought to myself, that's not good. I mean, is this your first child? She said, yes. And now anybody here who, who's had a first child knows that for the first six months of that first child, life is a blur. I mean, what could you possibly get done with a new baby in the house, okay? So I said, mm, nah, I'm not crazy about that. I said, you sure that's not gonna interfere with your edge? Absolutely not, I'm a pro. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I get the book back to her on January 1st and nothing happens. Weeks go by, months go by. And, I, and I'm like in a panic, what's happening with this? Where is the edits? So finally I call, I'm very persistent, and she said, oh, it's coming, it's coming. So I get it back. And I go through it and I see that she's changed a bunch of witches, W-H-I-C-H, to that's. And I said, even I know this book needs editing. I mean, where's the edit? 
So my daughter, my oldest daughter, was graduating from Berkeley at that time, and she was the valedictorian of the English department and wanted to be in the publishing business, be a writer. So she said, I want to go to New York, and I said, well, get a job. I said, well, why don't you go have lunch with my editor, and maybe they'll give you a job at Morrow. So she goes to New York, and she, she has lunch with my editor, and then she calls me, and she says, Dad, you have a problem. I said, what's that? She said, I just had lunch with your editor. And I sat across from her, and she had a buzz cut on one side of her head, and her hair was normal length on the other side. And my daughter is thinking, well, maybe this is some, you know, edgy New York hairdo. And then the woman said, well, I've just had brain surgery, and my hair is starting to grow back. She had a brain tumor, and no, no one told me. So I called her, and I said, Randy, why didn't you tell me that you had brain surgery? She says, oh, well. My husband left me, my mother died, and I just had this baby. And I had brain surgery. And I think to myself, how could anybody edit anything, you know, with, a, with I said, I was shocked. So she started having, because of the brain surgery, she started having some speech and language problems. So they, they didn't fire her, you know, they, they, they moved her to another apartment and they said, then I learned a new phrase in the publishing business. And that is that my book had been orphaned. And what orphaned means is that the way it works in the publishing business is that when an editor is interested in buying your book, they have a meeting every Tuesday morning in every publishing house, and the editors sit around and, they, and there's a certain pot of money to, for advances. And you, your editor has found your book and loved your book, and he says, I want to get this book. And the other editors have their books, their favorites, and they're fighting with the chief editor for how much money is gonna be distributed for these books. And if an editor, convinces the chief editor to let them publish this book, and that book goes on to make money for the publishing house, then that editor rises in the stature of the house. But if the editor chooses a book that's a flop and does that three or four times in a row, then that editor moves down the ladder. So your editor is like your champion. I mean, it's the key person that's gonna fight for your book. So when you lose your editor, Another editor doesn't want to pick it up because they didn't fight for it in the beginning and they're not going to get the credit you know, like they would have if it's their own book. So it's sort of like being asked to raise somebody else's child. You know, they're not enthusiastic about it. So months were going by and nothing was happening. So I flew to New York and I said, God damn it, I've got to find another editor at this house. So I had this romantic view that these editing houses, they sat with these corner office overlooking Manhattan. It's a rabbit warren of dirty little offices <laughs> occupied by young women who all seemed to smoke, and they were all in these rooms stacked to the ceiling with manuscripts. So I went into the first, you know, they gave me a list of editors, and I came in and I said to the first woman, I said, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm Leonard Schlein, and I've written this book, Art and Physics. I mean, if you read my manuscript, and she said, mm, that one in the box over there, yeah. I, I, I rifled through the first 200 pages. I said, well, what'd you think? She said, mm, needs a lot of work. So I said, well, what did you like and what didn't you like? And she said, mm, I, I, I'm, I like that Leonardo chapter. I, I thought that Leonardo chapter was very good. I said, okay. So I, I walked out of her office and I walked down the hall and I walked into another office, same setup, and I said, hi, uh, have you had a chance to look at my manuscript? And she said, mm. Uh, that one over there in the box? Yeah, yeah, I, I looked at it. I flipped through it. it looked, first 200 pages. I said, what do you think? She says, needs a lot of work. <laughs> That's what they always say. So I said, so I said, well, what did you like and what didn't you like? And she said, mm. she says, I, I thought that whole chapter on Leonardo was totally superfluous. Uh, <laughs> if I edit this book, that's the first thing that's coming out. So I backed out of her office and I <laughs> went down to the first one and I said, I want you to be my editor. And it turns out, it turns out that when you get a review in the newspapers, the reviewer is told that not only are they to review the book, but they're to put a sample of your writing in the review so that the reader who reads the review gets an idea of what kind of writer you are. The, the chapter most commonly quoted in my reviews was from the Leonardo chapter. Had I listened to the second one, I mean, it's, this is such a capricious business. Had I listened to the second one, and she'd been my editor, that chapter wouldn't even been in the book. So, although you get criticism, you have, <laughs> you have to temper it. I'm, I'm laughing because uh, um, when I uh, called the editor that had worked on this book to help me with this book, I called her up and I said, Barbara, I'm writing a new book and I'd like you to help me editing. She says, 
Let me see if I get this straight. You're going to pay me $40 an hour to take out a bunch of words out of your manuscript that you're going to put back in after I give it back to you. Is that right? <laughs> she says, I can do that. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of acerbic. And I told my wife that story. And my wife fell in a heap on the floor laughing. And I said, you're laughing too hard. <laughs> I said, you know, and she said, well, she says, that is so funny because, you know, I said, I take criticism good. I mean, I take it well, rather. She said, oh, yeah, sure, of course, you know. <laughs> and and my, my daughters have now said that they will not have, they will not read anything I write in the early stages. They say, Dad, we're here to support you. We, we don't want to criticize at all. We're not going to give you any suggestions. So, so you have to be very careful because um, when somebody says they don't like a sentence, he says, you don't like that sentence? That's one of my favorite sentences. <laughs> now, the harshest editor has to be you. You have to be an abortionist. <laughs> you have to look at your children and say, I'm going to kill you because I love you, I love you, I love spent so much time writing you, but you've got to go. And if you can't yourself see that that you've overwritten something. Because I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, Virginia Woolf has this wonderful essay about writing, and she said, you know, dogs bark, bills need to be paid, the, full, the doorbell rings. I mean, there's all these interruptions. I mean, it's so hard to find time to write next. So what I do is I'll start writing something, and then I got my life comes booming in, and I get interrupted. And the next thing you know, I come back, and I, I start writing it again. And before you know it, I've said the same thing three times in three different ways, and I love all three ways. So you look at it and you say, well, this is so charming the way I've said this, that even though I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. And that's when the abortionist has to kick in and say, kill this child. Get rid of it, because you cannot be repetitious. Get to the point, you know? So, so you have to develop in, among your, in your own heart um, your own set of values as to how you want to edit and how you want to cut out extraneous stuff. Because I have overwritten all three of these books. If, if I, each one of these books is a 1,500 page book that has been pared down to a 400 page book. I'll tell you a great story about Alphabet. They told me, they said, you must come under 500 pages. I thought, oh, it's going to be hard. So I wrote it and wrote it and wrote it, and I cut and I cut and I cut, and by God, and, oh, and they allowed me 85 images. So I had 85 images in the book, because it's a book, the book is about the conflict between word and image. So I had 85 gorgeous images of goddesses and other things that were in the book. And the book came out to be 560 pages. Well, I didn't know that. I mean, I just had a manuscript. So my kids always did this little trick where when the, pa pa the teacher told them to write up, 10-page paper, they wrote a five-page paper, and then they squinched in the margins, and they increased the font, and they you know, moved the thing down. So it turned out to be five pages on 10 pages. So I figured, I learned from them that if you can do that, then you can do the reverse. So I went through all the fonts to find the one that puts the most words on a page, and it's Arial Narrow, you know? And, and Arial Narrow puts the most words on a page, and then I slightly increased the margins, and I slightly decreased the font size, and I got it in under 500 pages, and the editor said, great. So then they put it and transfer it to the actual page, and it turns out it's 560 pages. <laughs> so they said, it's got to be under 500 pages. So they, so they send you the galleys, and the galleys are this wonderful moment when you finally get to see the raw pages of the book. They're not bound yet. You know, and all you want to do is just <laughs> You know, so they send me the galleys. They send me the galleys, and they said, you know, this came in at 560 pages, and we haven't even put the index in. You must cut out 80 pages. You must do it in a week, and if you don't, we're going to miss our publication date. So I thought, I said, you want me to cut 80 pages out of the book? So now I was faced. Talk about being hoisted on your own petard. I had written a book about the conflict between word and image. And I knew that if I took out an image, I got a half a page. If I took out the words that I wrote, I mean, and I had to choose between what I wrote and these images that I put in the book, the book ended up having 33 images. 
instead of 85 because I managed to save about, but I still had to cut out a lot. And it was painful. And then, and I thought to myself, well, Jesus, there's no transitions here. I know what's cut out. And when people read the book, they said, hey, this book is really well written. And I said, you think so? And I said, well, I know what's missing, you know, but they didn't, they didn't notice it. So whatever you're going to talk about. So, so then you, the other thing you have to, you know, uh, if you go to any expository writing class, what they'll tell you to do is they tell you what you're supposed to do in the first paragraph is state what you're going to write about. And then you write what you're going to write about, and in the last paragraph you sum up. Boring. I, I never write that way. I mean, you know, I, I like to tell jokes. So I like to, 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 to start writing and say that, have the reader say, where the hell is he going with this? You know, and then finally come to the punchline, which isn't a joke, but maybe a point, and I, I write in a rather circular fashion, you know, not, not to say that each sentence has to be linked to the sentence before, it has to be a, a very tight chain mail so that the reader doesn't get lost, but I also don't want, I think it's boring to tell the reader what you're going to say and then say it and then sum up again. So, I mean, that's fine for telling a fifth grader how to write an essay, but I don't think that makes for really interesting writing. Um, you have to, um, the, the other thing is, you, you have to have something important to say if you want to get a book published. Um, getting a book published is very difficult because, there, like I said, there's a lot of competition for, your, for people's attention. So you have to ask yourself, what have I got to say that's really, really interesting. I mean, if it's just a story about, is your life really, really, really interesting? Or is that, that's what you're writing about? Or something, it has to have some sort of a hook. I don't know how, how many of you are, there's a woman um, who wrote A Round-Heeled a round Woman. You, you know, here's the 67-year-old here's Berkeley, a retired woman professor who decided that she was single and she said the thought of never having sex again was just painful to her, so she put a personal ad in the New York Review of Books. And I don't know if you ever looked at the personal ads in the New York Review of Books, but the only people that put personal ads there are really erudite, you know, graduate of Vassar, I love poetry, Euripides is my favorite, looking for a man who likes Sophocles, you know, that, that, those, kind, those kind of ads. So she puts an ad in the New York Review of Books and said, you know, I'm a retired, I forgot, an English professor. I'm 67 years old. I, I don't want to go for the rest of my life without having sex. So I'm looking for men to have sex with. No, no strings attached, no questions asked. And, and all, she got all these replies. So she wrote a book about her experiences with, with all these men who were also retired English professors or young this. Or, and, you know, it's, now that's an interesting idea, you know? You know, I always said, well, that, that's a clever, clever idea, okay? And um, so, so you have to have... Did she find a man? Huh? Did she find a man? Well, she found a lot of them. <laughs> well, she wasn't, she said, she said, I'm not looking for a relationship. I'm just looking for what Erica Jong called a zipless buck. You know, I just, you know, no strings attached, you know? So, um... um was it the other she, I'm sure she was. The book has been very successful. But I, I mean, I was intrigued by it because it's such a clever, clever idea, you know. Um, so l let me pause here. It's now 3 o'clock. Let me just pause here because we'll take a little break and then I'll, um, I'll uh, well, we're going to ask, well, when we have to take some questions now and then we'll take a little break. Okay, question. Craigslist, uh, how do you spell that? C, just the, the way it sounds. C A C R A I G. L-I-S-T dot com. You know, it's just in every, just about every city. You, you talked about publicity going through traditional publishing practice. Right. But you haven't talked about all I, I will. Hours. I'm going to do that in the next hour. You know, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the craft of writing, and then I'll get into the mechanics of self-publishing versus publishing houses, agents, editors. So I'm going to discuss that in the next hour. Do you ever dictate your books? Do you ever no, I can't dictate them. I can't dictate them. I, I actually wrote the first book in longhand because among the skills that uh, escaped me, I had never learned how to type. Here I am a surgeon, you know, and I don't know how to type. So I wrote the book in longhand. I can't even believe that I did that. 
I mean, it's, it staggers my mind when I think about it. What I did is I found a woman who could read my handwriting, and I would write it in longhand, and she would then type it, and then I would make the corrections on the, the edits on the type page and drop it off to her, and we did this, for, I mean, it's, it was unbelievable that I did that. And with the second book, I said, oh, this is crazy, I've got to learn how to do this. And it was hunt and peck, and it was terrible. It took me a long time to do it. And then I made a fantastic discovery. And the discovery was, you know, I don't know whether you're aware of this, but Remington invented the typewriter in the 1890s. And the first typewriters were so clumsy, the keys kept getting stuck. And they said, we'll never sell this product. Who would, who would want to use it? So they said, let's design the keyboard so that 57% of all the keys that you have to hit are with your left hand. Because most people are right-handed. So the QWERTY keyboard is designed so that the A and the E and the F, you have to hit them with your left hand. And most people can't do that very well. So of course that slowed everybody down. And then when the typewriters improved, they never changed the keyboard. So if you think about it, if you're right-handed, what the hell are you doing having to do all these things with your left hand? And what I found is I kept hitting that goddamn caps key. <laughs> and, and I said, who designed this sucker? And I said, can't you, can't you uh, eliminate this key? And they said, no, you can't. You can't disable it. You can't. Otherwise, it'll screw up the whole keyboard. So I found that if you took a little piece of paper and wadded it up and stuck it down and jammed that key down, so now that I don't hit the caps key anymore, you know, when I'm typing, by God, I can type really fast now. That used to slow me down all the time, you know? So anyways, little hint. Um, but um, but I, I, I taught myself how to type. And I must admit, I'm still not, you know, um, What's her name? Um, the one that sells the typing uh, program, B Mavis, 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 somebody, or you know, Mavis Beepus or some whatever it is. But but I I can type reasonably well, and I can't even believe I try to do it. Don't try to do it in longhand. It's very very hard. I thought at first that my thought processes wouldn't be as good if I did it if I typed using a word processor, but I find that I can write just as well on a word processor as longhand. Question way in the back. Don't hire them. Don't hire them. No, don't hire them. I mean, ideally, I mean, well, I mean, I should temper that. And a good editor is a good editor. You know, they they can look and they can look at your work and see that it's just so see what needs to be you know moved over here, what need, which is repetition. So, and a good editor is a good editor. But ideally, you'd like to have somebody who's familiar with your genre. Okay, at least I would. Um, I must admit I have a couple of editors that I've used that, you know, they, they're not, they're just editors, you know. Uh, and by the way, I use more than one because if one editor, if somebody tells me to take something out and I don't, and I don't think it should come out, I won't leave, take it out. But then if the second and the third say take it out, then I say, oh, okay, I'm getting the message here, you know. And, and sometimes I've been stubborn and still left it in and then regretted it afterwards. Or maybe not, you know. But, um, but you know, you can, you, you, you can um, and of course, you know, hiring an editor is like hiring a lawyer, you know. They, you, know they, you have no idea how much time they're going to put into it. They send you the time sheet afterwards. They say, well, I put 30 hours in How do you know? <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's a process that, you know, you want to make sure you get somebody who's honest and who's good, you know. I, what I would do is, is maybe, um, say, you know, I'd like you to edit a, a little small part of this and, and give each one of them the same sample and say, just edit these 10 pages and let, let me see what kind of work you do, you know. And then you can find some, because it's a very personal relationship. You have to be able to work very well with them, you know. It's, uh, some editors are very hard and maybe that's good and some, you know, you don't want a real softy, you know. You want someone to be a critic. That's what you need. Because the critics that are going to review your book are going to be really harsh. Really. Do they will try to help you, but in the final analysis, you know your work, and you're the only person that really can do that. I mean, editors will do that to some extent, you know. But but it's um, it's something that it's it's the hardest part of writing is organizing your material so that it flows in a reasonably I, mean, I just had this insight after this book is all written. 
about how I should have changed several chapters and reversed them and put them in. A, and it's too late now because the book is already out. But I, but I realized that you know, this is an ongoing process. Mm, it would have been better to put that earlier on. And that, that belonged over there, you know. But that's the way it is. Question? Just a remark. The great thing is the writers of medical journal articles that came to the first uh, hour of your press because reading them is often so difficult. Because yeah. of the unnecessary conflict in the Well, n not only that, but um, the interesting thing about medical, of course, it's changing now, but when I first started in medicine, uh, a scientific article was purely descriptive. It contained no metaphors. So you never read a metaphor. So you read a scientific journal article, it's usually very descriptive language, and that's it. And just now we're starting to see articles where the, uh, the writer starts using metaphors, and the editors are letting them leave it in. Because you know, metaphoric writing is poetry. Now, that's what a metaphor is. You know, the Greek word metaphor, I mean, the, the word metaphor comes from two Greek words, a meta and pharin. And pharin means to bear a cross, and meta means above. So a metaphor is something that allows you to leap from one chasm to another over to the other side and get across a, a difficult bridge, you know? And, and that's what, you know, if, if I'm writing a scientific article, I never have to use a metaphor. I can just use purely descriptive language. But if I want to tell you how I feel, I have to use metaphors. You know, because my heart is colder than ice or soaring like an eagle. You know, you have to use a metaphor. So as a result, um, uh, metaphors are, to me, the, the, the actual spice of writing. The other question is, uh, what about the use of uh, parentheses in the body of the text? Oh, uh, the use of parentheses is a, uh, um, someone asked Richard Seltzer at this Squaw Valley Writers Conference, how do you become a writer? And he said, easy, just put parentheses around yourself. And I thought, what a great answer that is. Because, you know, to be a writer, you have to pull yourself out of the world put parentheses around yourself and, and block out the time to do the writing, you know, you're just kind of shut the world out. Um, parentheses are fine, uh, providing that you don't beat them to death, you know, it's like anything else. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, like uh, colons or uh, subjunctive tenses. I mean, you, 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 you can, they, they have their place, but you can't use too many of them. I, I, like, I, I like, in all my books, I've, I use pithy quotes. Uh, epigrams at the top of the chapter that somebody else has said, because there's so many in the people in the world that have said so many better things than I could ever say them, that I think to myself, what a shame, and, and, and most of my readers aren't aware of them. I mean, I showed some of them yesterday in the talk, you know, I, I put up those, those quotes, but some of them are just so wonderful. I think to myself, well, I, I have to share this with the readers, so I'm going to put them, you know, in epigrams at the top or, or liberally spice up my writing and say, you know, what so-and-so said, or, you know, it, it, it's, it's the perfect quote. And it's nice, you know, kind of, kind of, you, you kind of raise the level of the whole world. It's sort of like that Teilhard de Chardin concept of the newest sphere, you know, that we have this, this, um, this um, layer of consciousness in the world and that anybody that adds to it and raises it a little bit increases it. So I always sort of feel like if I'm going to throw in a quote from Santayana or some obscure writer that nobody has, knows about and it introduces them to that man's work or that woman's work and it's, it increases the general newest sphere of the world. Question? Yeah, on your first book, uh, how long do you persist with the proposal before you either change I, I'm going to, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that in the next hour. I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about the craft of writing and then get into the how do you sell your writing how do you get it published and whatnot in the next hour? So I'll, I'll discuss that. Um, okay, why don't we take a break for about five minutes? It's 3.15. We'll reconvene at 3.20. And whatnot. You know, it used to be that the, uh, a bright young um, college graduate from Yale or Princeton or Vassar would graduate with an English degree or liberal arts, and they would head for New York and get a job in the uh, publishing company, publishing business, uh, reading manuscripts. 
And they were the, they were the ones that you, you, know, you, you submit a manuscript and they read it. As a result of this enormous consolidation of the publishing business and the profit-driven motives of the publishing houses, those people are all gone. So there's no one to read your manuscript at the publishing house. So when you send a manuscript, it's called an over-the-transom manuscript, meaning like you threw it over the transom. So you'll get a rejection letter back, and nobody read it. It'll say, thank you very much. This is a very interesting thing. However, we uh, don't, are not publishing books of this genre at this moment. So that's not always the case, but it's pretty much the case. So what the publishing house is depending upon is that now that the young editors to read the manuscripts are gone, the, the next layer is the agents. So an agent comes into the publishing house and they say, I have got a fabulous book for you. You know, um, uh, this guy wrote a book about how to do it in the woods. You know, in other words, how to relieve yourself in the woods. I was, the, you know, I won't even go through what the real title of the book was. He sold it, you know, because they thought it was a novel idea. So the agent comes in and says, I got a great book for you. This, this is the next Hemingway. And the editor says, oh, okay, uh, you know, and, and they, if this is a new um, agent, they take a look at it, and if this is a really good book, they buy the book from the agent, and then if that book sells, then the agent moves up a notch. So the next time he calls or she calls to get an appointment with the editor, he may get an appointment a little bit sooner. So a good agent is somebody who's got a good eye. And think of the agent as the person who is now the filter that's this work into the publishing house. So the publishing house doesn't want to see a manuscript that isn't represented by an agent because they don't have the time, they don't have the manpower to read over the transom manuscripts. Now that's not 100% true, but as a general rule, that holds. So, question, go ahead. Should you, like one agent asks for $150 for stamps for six months. Okay, now there are two kinds of agents. There are agents that make their living by charging would-be writers reading fees. That's the way they make their money. So. You, you find their name usually in that big book of agents, and it, it's a very lucrative thing. They say, I'll read your manuscript for $500, and you send me for stamps and blah, 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 blah. So in your, in your hopes, you write out a check to them. They never even read your book. Okay, most of them don't. You know, they'll, they'll send it back to you and say, you know, I'm not interested. This particular one said the 150 was for stamps, and then they kept writing me letters telling me where they were sending it to. Okay, all right. Well, I, I just want to... Uh, that a really good agent um, it makes their money by selling books to the publisher and then the agent gets typically 15% of what you earn. In fact, the, the royalty checks don't even go to the writer, they go to the agent first. They take their 15% and then send you the rest. So you have to beware if you're going to find an agent that it's not an agent who's, who's in the business of ripping off writers and stealing their hopes, as opposed to an agent who's really serious about taking your book to New York or wherever and selling it, and making their money from the commissions of a book that's published and sells. So, so that in itself, I, I don't even know how to tell you. I think it's mainly by word of mouth. You know, you, you find somebody, uh, you, you know, oh, by the way, there was somebody here from New Orleans. There she is. Uh, would you stand up for a moment and, and tell me your name again? Nancy, would you tell tell the group a little bit about what you what you want and what you're looking for? Okay, I um, co-own and edit a psychology journal called Spring, a journal of architecture and culture. And we're looking for people to write about the history of the Okay, so if any of you are interested in seeing something published um, and have an article, you can see her afterwards. Um, so, 
So agents are, I think, at this point in publishing history, somewhat, uh, or not somewhat, but very important as the first step to getting published. Um, I'll tell you two agent stories. Um, when I was writing this book, um, I thought this was going to be a hobby. I thought this was something I was going to do when I retired. So, so what I found is that if I agreed to give a talk to any group, that the deadline of having to stand up in front of people forced me to organize what I was going to say and forced me to outline it and write it, and, and it gave me a little impetus. So I, would, I was giving talks all over the Bay Area to any little group that would hear me. So one night I gave a talk to the Mill Valley Literary Society, which was this little group of 15 people in somebody's living room. And I gave a talk on a chapter from Art and Physics. And after I finished, um, this man came up to me and said, this is very interesting what you had to say. Do you have this written down? And I said, um, well, I do, but it's not, you know, I haven't really shown it to anybody. Well, can I read it, you know? So I, uh, sure, I said, why not? You know, he said he was an agent, and I said, how long have you been an agent? And he said he was just new. He just started being an agent. He'd had a bookstore before. He gave up the bookstore, and now he was going to be an agent. So at the same time, I had become friends with Fritjof Capra, who wrote The Tao of Physics, and I was telling him about this book that I was writing, and he said, my agent is John Brockman in New York. Now, Brockman is one of the largest, biggest agents in New York. And he gets huge advances. You see his name in the paper all the time. He's got a big table of writers. And he said, Brockman is coming out to um, California, where he has Stuart Brand and Capra and Michael Murphy and all these sort of new age authors. And they have a salon. And I'll take you to the salon and introduce you to him. I said, all right. So I go, and Brockman says, Capra says you've got a really interesting book. Do you have it with you? And I said, well, I mean, he says, give it to me, and I'll, I'll take it back with me on the plane. I'll read it on the plane. And you'll have an answer in seven days. So I was like, stars in my eyes. Oh, my God. So I went to the trunk of my car, and I gave him this manuscript. And then I went off on a vacation with my kids, and I thought to myself, I'm going to be famous. Brockman's got to end it. You know, and I was so excited. Seven days go by, I don't hear anything from him. Eight days, nine days, ten days. I get nervous. I call his office, and I start getting the runaround. Oh, he just went to lunch. Oh, he just went into a meeting. You know, as a surgeon, I'm not used to getting the runaround. You know, I mean, I'm used to when I tell somebody I want to talk to them, I talk to them, you know. So finally, the secretary said, oh, well, haven't you received our letter yet? And I was on vacation. I said, what letter? They said, well, we sent out a letter to you. And I said, that can't be good. So I get home, and I got this letter, and it says, your work uh, is very interesting, but frankly, uh, we're not interested. So I said, damn. I said, I need to know why he rejected this book. So I called the secretary back, and I said, look, this is my nickel. I want to speak to Brockman. I'll do it collect so he can reverse the charges. I need to know why he rejected this book. Uh, you know. So sure enough, he calls me back, and the guy was absolutely brutal. He said, this is as if a high school student, I still, you know, you always remember your worst reviews. This is as if a high school student had taken a bunch of five by seven cards and just jumbled them all up. That's what I thought of your book. He said, this is not ready to be published. I mean, he was like <laughs> <laughs> So I hung up the phone. I was so sorry I called him to ask why I didn't, you know, it was so painful. You know, I remember it was a very miserable, cloudy, rainy day. And I, I, I was looking out the window, and I said, who the hell did I think I was that I, well, what's the matter with me? I'm, what a dummy. I wasted all this time doing this. And then the phone rang. And it was the guy from the Mill Valley Literary Society, Robert Stricker. And he says, I have just finished reading your book. I think this is terrific. <laughs> and I said, and I just had this major agent tell me it was a piece of crap. And here's this young guy who is just starting out telling me that he thinks this is terrific. So, of course, I didn't want to believe him. And I said, well, you know. He said, no, 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 this is really good. I want to represent you, and I want to, I, I'll get you a publisher in New York. I said, yeah, yeah, right. So he was very persistent. He kept calling me. So finally, he took me to lunch one day, and he said, listen, I'm going to New York next week. Is it OK if I just tell them about you? I said, well, we don't have any formal arrangement. He said, I just want to tell them there's this guy out in California writing this very interesting book. 
This is a crazy idea. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you one chapter of the book, and you can take it back to New York and show it to one publisher. Because I had heard that if you get rejected from a publisher, they don't want to see it again. I mean, you can't clean it up and then go back. I mean, it's, forget it. You, know, you got one shot at this. So he said, OK, that's a deal. So I, gave, I went home and I really worked on this one chapter. I gave it to him. And he left on a Monday, and he said, I'll call you. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I figured, well, he obviously failed, and he's too embarrassed to call me. So towards the end of the next week, I get this phone call, and he says, I hope you don't mind, but I didn't stick to our agreement. I showed it to the first publisher, and he was so enthusiastic about it that I showed it to the bunch of other publishers, and there are eight New York publishers that, that are interested in this book. Random House, Viking, Morrow, Houghton Mifflin, uh, Simon & Schuster. And I'm, you know, there's a few moments in your life where you take a phone and you're kind of like, <laughs> you know, what? So I said, well, what happens now? And he said, well, they want to see the rest of the book. And I said, well, it's not written. He said, write it. <laughs> so, so when I say it took me 10 years to write this book, I really wrote most of it in the last um, year and a half. I mean, I was, a, I was like a man possessed. You know, my kids tell these incredible stories about how I would take them on vacation and they'd, they'd go to the bathroom at four in the morning. They'd find me sitting in the in the bathroom with the light on. You know, write, writing. You know, um, you know, writing away. Um, so, so I had had I listened to the first or let the first agent discourage me, that would have been the end of my career. You know, and then there's an interesting story about that. He. He submitted it to seven publishers. And I had just finished reading Timothy Ferris's um, Life in the Milky Way or something like that. I, I forgot the title of the book. And I said, well, why didn't you submit it to Morrow? And he said, well, he said, it's not kind of their kind of book. And I said, yes, it is. I just finished reading this book by Ferris, and that's their kind of book. That's my kind of book. He says, well, I don't want to submit it to Morrow because we've already submitted it to the other seven, and it's insulting if they get the book late. I said, what do I care if they're insulted? You know, submit it. What, what have we got to lose, you know? He said, OK, OK, OK. So he submitted it to Moore, William Morrow and Company. And wouldn't you know it, you know who published the book? William Morrow and Company, you know? Had it not been for that persistence, I would be, you know, some guy that said, well, I tried to write a book once, and I couldn't get it published. Um, uh, somebody asked me the question about the proposal. I don't write proposals. I, I, I write the book. I mean, I didn't submit a proposal with Art and Physics. He just took back that one chapter, and I think maybe he wrote a proposal. But um, I pretty much ha had the book finished. When, they, when the publishers first said they want to see the rest of the book, I wrote the whole book. I didn't submit a proposal. So I submitted the whole book, and what ended up happening is they had a um, they said um, they wanted to meet me. The publishers that were interested wanted to meet me. So here was the finest day of my life. I flew to New York, and my day started out at Random House. And you go to 54th Avenue, and you go up to the top floor, and they usher me into this corner office, and they said, the publisher is busy, busy in a meeting. And she said, please make yourself comfortable, and she'll be back in a little bit. So they closed the door. I'm in this office by myself, corner office, overlooking Manhattan. I'm by myself. And I start thinking Frank Sinatra, New York, New York, you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And I thought, I was like, well, we have a camera in here, and they're watching it, you know? And so, so she comes walking in, and she said, oh, Dr. Schling, she said, we would be honored here at Random House to have your book. And I'm like, you, you talking to me? I mean, so then I leave her, and I go down to Houghton Mifflin, and talk to the senior editor, and he said, I will hang by my thumbs to get this book. That's how badly we want this book here at Houghton Mifflin. I said, you do? Hang by your thumbs? <laughs> then I went down to Simon & Schuster, and she said, we love this book. We've got to have this book. I said, this is amazing. Then they're going on to Morrow. And Morrow, the editor was this young travel editor. I said, what kind of books do you use? She said, I do travel books. I said, why do you want to do this book? She said, I love this book. I said, oh, OK. So they held a bidding war. So the way a bidding war works is the uh, agent says, at 8.30 in the morning on May 30th, at, uh, anybody who's interested in this book has to call and make a bid. 
and the floor bid is going to start at $150,000. And I was like, I'm in the money. Oh my God, $150,000. I got two million when we finish. So 8.30 in the morning, the travel editor, the travel editor from Morrow calls. She says, I'm in. Within minutes, uh, um, uh, Houghton Mifflin and Random House called, I'm in, I'm in. So I said, well, what happened to Simon & Schuster? Turns out that the Simon & Schuster lady went on vacation and had, had the wrong day marked on her calendar, we found out later, so she never made a bid. So by the end of the day, nobody else had called in, and we had these three. I said, I'll take it. I mean, we can Random House and, and uh, Houghton Mifflin and Morrow. This is terrific. And then I said, wait a minute, nobody offered any money. So I called the agent back. I said, well, wh what does that mean that nobody offered any money? He said, it is a little strange. <laughs> So then the three of them started to do F to you, Alphonse. No, you guessed on you first. Each one of them wanted to see who was going to put up actual money. And they delayed it. And with each passing day, I was going, my stock was going down because they said, ah, the other two aren't that interested. Maybe we can get this on the cheap. So what ended up happening is the guy who said he was going to hang by his thumb said, you know, my publisher just doesn't like the book. I'm out. The lady from Random House who said, oh, I'd be so honored to have you, she said, you know, my editor says this book is elliptical. I said, Ellipti <laughs> elliptical? I had to go to the dictionary to look up what elliptical meant, you know? I said, what do you mean it's too elliptical? She says, it's too elliptical. We're out. So then Morrow says, so, we're the only bidder, is that right? Oh, how nice. We'll give you 30000 you know, and that's it. So I said, okay, I'll take it. So then when I lose my editor, and the book is orphaned, now they said, well, you don't have an editor. You have to find an editor. And if you don't find an editor, we're out of our contract. We'll give you the money back. I, you know, you know, I said, whoa, 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 no, <laughs> because I don't want to go through this again. You know, So it, it was a very traumatic thing. In, in the end, Morrow published it. And the end of the story is that Morrow was bought by HarperCollins. And then Viking has been my publisher for these last two books. And I wanted to get all three books at Viking, because when the rep goes out to sell the books in the bookstores, it's best to have all three of them under one rep. And Viking sells to the Penguin rep, sell to the colleges, where the other ones don't. And these books have been big hits on college campuses. So I said, let's buy from, more, from HarperCollins the art and physics book and get all three of them under the Penguin imprint. And HarperCollins said, nothing doing. We're selling this book so well, we don't want to sell it. We offered them $100,000 for it. They wouldn't sell it. So there you have it. So now I've got this one book over there, my orphan book. You know, it, But they're doing a nice job with it, so I can't complain. OK, so getting back to agents. <laughs>